Uh, my name is Ricky. This is Sean. So as Patrick said, I've been with the company for a little over a year. And uh, my primary role is with support and QA. So today we're going to be doing an introduction to Kazoo API. Sean's going to go over some of the basic concepts of what an API is. And I'm going to be showing some tools we can use to interact with them. Uh, but if I can get a show of hands, how many of you know what an API is? OK. And how many of you work with APIs before? And how many of you work with Kazoo APIs specifically? OK, so there's a good number of you. Uh, this talk is geared primarily for building the foundation for people who are not so familiar with APIs. Uh, the goal is to get them enough information so that we don't completely lose them in our other talks about APIs. All right? So, uh, Sean? Hi. So, uh, as Ricky said, my name is Sean. Uh, I'm a mm -hmm. sort of a newcomer to 2600 Hertz. I've been with the company two whole months. And uh, I'm going to go through the concepts behind our APIs to kind of introduce all of the fundamentals. Uh, and then Ricky's going to demonstrate those in just a minute. So, the first question we have when we get into definitions is what is an API? So, when we talk about APIs, we're talking about an interface provided by a server that is intended for use by applications. The interface provides a predictable and simple method for applications to connect and interact with remote services. Developers can use APIs to leverage external services to add complex functionality to their applications with just a few lines of code. So I like analogies. So uh, think of an API as like a bolt. Use bolts to build something useful. Uh, your application is like a wrench. So a bolt has specific parameters like the shape and size of the bolt that wrenches need to conform to. So we provide standard sizes and shapes for our bolts and you can innovate to build a better wrench as long as you conform to our specifications. individual account or an individual user. We use IDs to identify the entities. Every entity has an ID we can refer to it by. So now that we know uh, that, uh, how do we tell the server what specific resources we want to interact with? The way that we do that in REST APIs is via a URI. Uh, URI is just a string which identifies a resource. The string can be thought of as a chain of resources which combine to determine the specific resource being referenced. So the URI is here to tell the server what thing we want to interact with. So to understand how a URI works, let's break apart the chain and we'll step through it link by link. So the first link in the chain is a base URL. Uh, this tells us what address on the internet we can go and access the API. The next link in our chain is a version number. We use versioned APIs, which means we can add additional functionality while maintaining backwards compatibility. The next link in the chain is accounts. Accounts is an example of an endpoint. Uh, an endpoint is a collection of one type of resources. So if we want to access this, an individual account, we can add an account ID to the end of our chain. And uh, this will access a specific account entity. Uh, going farther, if we wanted to access the users in a specific account, we could add users to our chain. And now we're accessing all of the users under this account. 
And following through with that, if we add an ID to our users in the chain, now we're referencing a specific user on this account. So now that we know how we can identify uh, specific resources, how do we tell the server what to do with the resources that we've identified? And the way that we do that in REST APIs is using HTTP verbs. There are basically four HTTP verbs that are used commonly in REST APIs, which are get, put, post, and delete. So there are verbs that are specific to interacting with collections. Uh, for example, get in this example would retrieve a collection of all of the users under this account. Uh, we would use put to create a new user on this account. Uh, with put, we would have to include a data payload with the parameters we want to configure on that user. So the other way, uh, the other verbs are for interacting with entities. Uh, so you can use get again, which in this case would return uh, the specific parameters of this specific user. You can see a user ID in this URI. Uh, and also we have posts, which works like an update. Uh, a post also requires a data payload. And the last uh, verb for interacting with entities is delete. Uh, that does what it sounds like it does. It just deletes the entity. So one of the really nice things about REST APIs is that it leverages the HTTP response codes. Uh, so these uh, response codes are telling you the status of your request. So those of you that are familiar with SIP will be very familiar with these. We have a 2XX, which indicates a successful response. Uh, 4XX uh, is a, indicates a client-side problem, which would usually be something invalid in the request. And a 5XX means the server encountered an error. Uh, one other thing we need to talk about with HTTP is headers. Uh, we use headers uh, to describe and define values that determine how a request is formatted. So you can specify things like a content type header, which would define the data format of the payload you're sending. Um, so the next concept is payloads. So a payload is just a representation of the resource we requested. So an API abstracts all the resources so that we can retrieve them in an expected format. The actual entity referred to uh, in a URI could, be used, uh, could use any number of ways to store its data uh, locally, but this will always be delivered in the API in an expected format. So our APIs most commonly use uh, JSON uh, as the format for our payloads. JSON is a very easily readable, widely supported format for storing data in nested structures. Uh, the most basic element in JSON objects is a key value pair. Uh, a key is just a name for a parameter. And a value can be any of the available data types in JSON, which are uh, the typical uh, data types you'd see in most mainstream programming languages. You have strings and numbers and booleans, which are either true or false, uh, null, uh, or an array, which is an ordered list of values, or an object, which is an uh, unordered list of uh, key value pairs. So at the base of a JSON object is an object, uh, which is the envelope of the uh, JSON data. JSON supports some pretty complex nested structures, so you can pretty much represent anything you want using JSON objects. In our API specifically, we always have a data object which contains the payload. Anything outside of the data object uh, is metadata, so that could be something that you need to uh, help handle a specific type of request. So uh, let's put this all together and look at some HTTP uh, requests. So. This is an example of a get message. This is submitted with no payload included. You can see a request line which contains the HTTP verb, a request URI, the HTTP version, and host. That's in the red. Uh, this request also contains some headers. This is an example of the response we would get back if our get request was successful. You see in the response line we have a 200 OK message. Uh, the server returns a bunch of headers. One of those headers is the X request ID, which is very useful when you're debugging requests that aren't working. Uh, and also a payload, which contains the data that we've requested from the server using the get verb. So I wanted to show one example also of a request which includes a payload. So we have a put here. This is actually, uh, you can see the verb here instead of get in the red line is put. Uh, the URI is user auth. 
and the host is uh, the host that uh, the API resides on. And in the request payload, we have a data object with a key value pair for credentials and a key value pair for account name. Uh, this is actually a request that you would use to authenticate with our servers. Um, this will return back uh, a 201 created if it was successful, uh, which would indicate uh, this. the request payload will include uh, a, the data object, which includes information about your account, and also some metadata, including an authorization token in this case, because we were asking for one. So to kind of recap, a URI is a noun which identifies a specific resource. The HTTP method is a verb which defines what type of action we want to take against the resource. And the contents of the payload is generally stored in a JSON object. So now that we've established the fundamentals, let's actually play with the kazoo UIs. Ricky? All right, so um, you guys all received logins for uh, kazoo accounts, is that correct? Yes? Uh, so I'm going to be running through the developer's app. I'm going to be doing some curl requests, and uh, I'm going to do some examples through Postman. To get started, ooh, let me fix my display really quick. <laughs> So one of the easiest ways to get started is through our portal. If you do log in, uh, what you want to do is hover on the top right corner, go locate the App Store, and go ahead and enable the developer's app. While you're in there, you will also want to enable the hosted PBX and also the accounts app. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and hit save. The page will go ahead and refresh. You can also go into the developer's app and see that this is the list of endpoints and resources that we can interact with. If you select one of these endpoints and resources, it will show you the available verbs. Uh, just as a quick example, we can get a list of devices in this account. So this is the URL that we made the request to. Uh, within the developer's app, we auto-populate uh, your account ID for you. And this is the JSON response, uh, including the list of devices within this account, uh, returns the name along with the ID. If we, for example, wanted more information on this particular device, we can copy this ID, go down to our next API, click on get and paste in the ID, click on try it. Now you notice that our URL has changed. Uh, it's appended the device ID, and instead of a list of devices, uh, it returns. Oh, it, we're only showing the demo on one right now. Uh, sorry about that. So right now, uh, the device ID has been appended, and instead of a list of particular devices, uh, it shows all the attributes associated to this one particular device. Uh, this is information including the SIP username and password, uh, any call restrictions, call ID, uh, et cetera. So one of the things that the developer's app does hide for you is the auth token. Uh, it the auth token is just a temporary security token that we generate uh, using your username, password, and account. It's represented by a 32-bit alphanumeric key. Uh, uh, key. Uh, in order to generate the auth token, what you want to do is do a put request uh, to the user auth API. And you can see an example right here. Uh, let me pull it up on my screen. So the payload that you want to include is the credentials and either your account name or the realm. Now in this case, the credentials is not just your simple uh, username and password, it's actually an MD5 hash of the string username colon password. Uh, you must include the colon. If you don't, your request will come back as invalid credentials. Uh, there are multiple ways of generating an MD5 hash. Uh, if you do echo, 
and pipe into an MD5 hash, what you want to do is include the dash N option. Uh, that just means to not include the trailing uh, new line character. Uh, if you don't include that option, your credentials will come back as invalid when you make the put request. So we go back into the developer's app. Uh, you'll also notice down here on the bottom, it includes a curl request. And curl is just a tool uh, that makes it very easy for you to send and receive requests uh, through the command line. So if we walk through the curl command, uh, this is the headers that it's including, uh, the verb, get in this case, and also the URL. Uh, we can copy and paste this into our command line. And you can see that this was a successful request uh, indicated by the 200 OK on top. And this down here is actually JSON, except in a format that makes your eyes want to bleed. So we have a trick to fix that. Uh, if we remove the dash I option, which just means uh, to include the headers in our response, and if you have Python installed, uh, you can pipe this into Python's pretty fire. And then we get the same request back, except in a much more readable format. So curl is very useful when you want to just test out a request just to make sure you don't have any errors, you have all your required fields before you actually input them into your program. Okay. So the next tool I want to go over is Postman. So Postman is basically just like curl, uh, wrapped in a very nice user interface and also in the web browser. Uh, we take a look at Postman. Uh, this is where we would indicate our URL. Up top here, this is to the right, is where we select our verbs. If we want to include any headers, these are our options here. Uh, it has a nice feature of saving a history of all your API requests. Uh, it also allows you to create a collection of APIs to reference later. Very We go ahead and send. Okay, that was successful. And if we go into this account that we just created and we go check our users list, we can go ahead and see our user that has been created here. So let's create a device for this user. So creating a device is just like creating a user. Uh, the first thing we want to do is make sure that the account ID matches 
the account we just created. If we copy, paste that into Postman, make sure our endpoint is the devices. And the only required field for a device is just the name. Uh, depending on the type of device, you can actually indicate that. If you don't indicate the type of device, it defaults to just the void. Uh -huh. Go ahead, send. And now we can check to see if the device has been created. There we go. We have our test device one. Uh, currently, it's not assigned to a particular user. Uh, if we wanted to update this, this particular device, what we want to do is copy the response we got our, from our previous request, paste it into our payload. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is input the device ID. Uh, the device ID can be found here in the response. This says that we want to work with this particular device. Uh, we don't want to create a new one. We want to update it, so we want to change our verb to post. And we can include a new field. Uh, this can be anywhere within the data payload. Uh, I'm going to call this owner underscore ID. And this is where you want to grab the user ID of the user that we just created. Uh, you would do that through uh, the developer's app. If you scroll down to users and you click get, this will return a list of users within this account along with the ID. And we grab the ID uh, that we want to associate with. Paste that into the response. Go ahead and hit send. And now you see within the response it includes the owner ID now. And if we check back into our portal, we can see that now the device should be assigned to the user. Uh, let's make another quick edit. Say, for example, that the user forgot to pay their bill and we want to just disable their device. We can change enable from true to false. We can send that in again. Navigate back to the portal. And if we refresh the page, we can see that the device is now disabled or no longer enabled. Uh, the last thing, uh, if we wanted to delete this device entirely, we just change our verb from post to delete. Uh, the payload does not matter. You can just send in the request. And if we refresh the page, the device is no longer. Cool. So I've shown you some basic uh, API requests and how easy it is to get started. Um, you can make uh, new accounts, new devices, how to edit them how to delete them, uh, but how is this applicable, right? And uh, one of the easiest ways uh, to get the most bang for your time invested is to just build a simple sign-up page. And uh, most programming languages will have a library, an uh, HTTP library, so you can interact with APIs. We also have an SDK available in PHP, JavaScript, and Node.js. Uh, so this is a very crude HTML page that I wrote. Darren wasn't too happy with it, uh, but it works. And he also got a web developer to put a nice CSS wrapper around it. And what this does, uh, if I can show you the code, mm -hmm. is just two simple functions. Uh, one function to create a new account. All it takes is the account name, and it will return the account ID for you. And another to create an admin user within that account. In the main body of uh, the program, uh, the options up top is where we indicate our URL. The auth token is generated using the username, password, and realm. Uh, the SDK client is initiated with our auth token and options. Um, and this is just passing over the form data that we received to the two functions that we just created earlier. So. Uh, this is where we want you to get creative because this sign-up page is very specific to 2600 hertz. When we onboard a new client, all we give them is just an account with a username. Um, a sign-up page for you guys, depending on your business model, could be different. It could be a user, device, voicemail, and a call flow. Uh, or if you're selling conference bridges, you can have a function to spin up conference bridges and tear them down. Uh, you can actually get the SDK on our GitHub repo. We're looking for more PHP developers to help flesh out the SDK. Uh, feel free to clone it, 
play around with it. If you make changes, you can do, uh, make a pull request. And also, if you have any questions, you can look for us on our mailing list at Google Groups 2600 Hertz Dev and 2600 Hertz Users. Um, I do encourage you guys to try to create a sign-up page if you have not done so already. You can look for an engineer if you guys run into trouble, or you can come find me, uh, and I'll help you guys out with that. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm.